The business of Imperial Secession, following the death of Wu Di, had been a little messier than previous occasions. The son who had been heir apparent for most of Emperor Wu's reign, Liu Zhu, had been demoted and killed during the witchcraft crisis of 91, and for the final four years of Wu Di's time on the throne, the empire had been without a crown prince. And when, on Wu Di's deathbed, a successor was chosen, it was an odd choice. The man, or rather boy, who would be the next emperor was Liu Fu Ling, Wu Di's youngest son, born to a consort named Zhao. The boy Fu Ling had been chosen over either of his two brothers, Dan or Su, both of whom were adults and had experience running their own vassal kingdoms. And what's more, the circumstances of the announcement were a bit suspicious. The edict charged a certain palace attendant with the very important duty of acting, quote, as an assistant to the young ruler. That palace attendant was Huo Guang, a trusted counsellor, though otherwise unnotable fellow, who just so happened to be the one who had elicited this final decision from the dying emperor. Huo Guang justified the choice of Liu Fu Ying and his own appointment as effective regent by an appeal to an historical episode from the Book of Documents, one that had been well discussed in Confucian literature such as the Mencius and the Zhuo Commentary. Apparently, a few years previously, Wudi had gifted Huo a painting, depicting the Duke of Zhou carrying King Cheng on his back. According to the Book of Documents, the Duke of Zhou was the brother of the first king of the Zhou dynasty, King Wu. When King Wu died, the Duke of Zhou acted as benevolent regent for the king's youngest son, Cheng, who had succeeded to the throne despite having older brothers. According to Huo, while he had been waiting on the dying emperor, Wu Di had told him, quote, Have you never grasped the meaning of the painting? Enthrone my youngest son and act as the Duke of Zhou. Historians have contested whether or not Huo Guang's announcement was a true transmission of Wu Di's will, or whether he manipulated the imperial secession to his own ends, putting a pliable young lad on the throne and granting himself a very powerful position. Homer H. Dubbs, translator of the Book of Han, considers it to have been Wu Di's real intention to grant this much responsibility to Huo Guang. He believes that Wu Di did not trust his own sons enough to grant them the rule of the empire, and instead effectively passed it on to one of his attendants whom he knew to be capable. Other historians, like Michael Lowe, editor of the Cambridge History of China, expressed more doubt, saying, quote, How far the outcome was the result of the emperor's expressed wish, and how far it followed from Huo Guang's own intentions, may never be known. What most agree upon is that for most of the reign of Liu Fu Ling, known to history as Xiao Zhao Huangdi, filial and brilliant August Emperor, it was really Huo Guang who was calling the shots. He held the all-important position of director of the Secretariat, the man who filtered all communication to the Emperor, as well as the daunting title Marshal of State, which ranked him above all the other officials and ministers. Moreover, the young Zhao Di was amicable to Huo Guang's influence and happy to approve Huo's suggestions. Mind you, the reins of government weren't held by Huo Guang alone. There were several other men who had influential positions. Jin Midi, a surrendered Xiong Nu who had become part of the inner court, and Shang Wan Jie, a soldier who had risen to a relatively high level of command, were both appointed guardians of the eight-year-old emperor alongside Huo Guang and given the rank of generals. It's not clear to me why these two men were chosen, whether it was by Wu Di or Huo Guang himself. However, I'd guess that if the initiative came from Wu Di, it was to prevent Huo from having total control over the next emperor, and that if the initiative was from Huo Guang, it was to avoid appearing as if he had total control over the next emperor. Apart from Jin Midi and Shang Wan Jie, another important and influential man was Sang Hong Yang, the imperial counsellor and the mastermind behind the Sultan Eye monopolies that had been introduced to help finance Wu Di's wars. The chancellor was a man named Tian Qian Xiu, though he was apparently a bit of a passive agent and didn't play much of a role in court politics. There were others whom Huo had to keep in mind, namely the sons of Wu Di who had been passed over in favour of Zhao Di. These were Liu Dan, king of Yan, and Liu Su, king of Guangling. Liu Dan especially felt like he had been cheated out of the throne. Huo also had to consider Princess A Yi, Zhao Di's oldest sister, who was probably the person most intimate with the boy. Seeing that their mother was dead, primary caretaking for the boy emperor in his personal life fell to Er Yi. Huo tried very hard to keep these important people on his side. In the spring of 86 BC, the fiefdoms of Liu Dan, Liu Su, and Princess Er Yi were all increased. Huo also attempted to forge closer ties to Jin Midi and Shang Wan Jie. He married one of his daughters to Jin, and another to Shang Wan Jie's son, Shang Wan An. 
For now, it kept most of the notables happy. Most, that is, except for Liu Dan, the king of Yan. In the autumn of 86 BC, he attempted a coup to try and take the throne for himself. He claimed that Zhao Di was not really Wu Di's son, and tried to start a rebellion with another member of the imperial clan, Liu Ze, the grandson of Liu Jiang Lu, the former king of Qi who had committed suicide following the revolt of the Seven Kingdoms. Dan and Ze attempted to kill Chuan Bu Yi, their local regional inspector, but their conspiracy was discovered before they could succeed. Liu Dan got off scot-free. Either he managed to conceal his involvement in the plot, or he was let off by the imperial government. An edict from six years after the attempt claimed that he had been deliberately allowed to go free, saying that the matter was, quote, oppressed and not made public, hoping that the king would mend his ways and reform himself. It may have been quite a bad look for both Xiao Di and Huo Guang to punish the emperor's half-brother so soon into the reign. It's possible, though, that this edict from six years later was just a way of saving face after Dan's role in the conspiracy of 86 later came to light. Liu Zhe was not so lucky. He and others who had been involved were executed. A month after the conspiracy, Jin Midi died, leaving just Huo Guang and Shang Wan Jie as the regents for the young emperor. The two made well of themselves. In spring 85, they were in fiefed, Huo as Marquise of Bo Lu and Shang Wan as Marquise of An Yang. At the same time, a member of the imperial clan, Liu Bichiang, was made superintendent of guards at the Changgu Palace. This was an unusual decision. Normally, members of the imperial clan did not hold government positions, except for the superintendent of the imperial clan, one of the nine ministers who was responsible for matters of protocol for meetings between different members of the Liu family. Huo Guang probably decided to give the job of superintendent of guards to a Liu in an effort to show that, despite the fact that he was basically running the show, and that he was promoting his family and allies, he had no intentions of usurping the imperial clan. Huo Guang wasn't the only man working to consolidate his position. Shang Wan Jie had ambitions for his family as well. He and his son, Shang Wan An, hoped to marry An's daughter to Zhao Di. This daughter was the product of An's own marriage to one of Huo Guang's daughters, meaning she was Huo Guang's granddaughter as well. When Shang Wan Jie suggested marrying the girl to the emperor, Huo Guang was against the idea, saying that she wasn't old enough. She was in her sixth year, and Zhao Di himself was in his twelfth. Both of them would usually have been considered too young for marriage. Therefore, Shang Wan Jie sought the support of another power broker, Zhao Di's sister, Princess Ai Yi. But Princess Ai Yi had already brought another girl to the palace, planning to marry her to Zhao Di when they were old enough. Shang Wan Jie exploited Princess Ai Yi's own love life in order to win her support. Ai Yi was romantically involved with a man named Ding Wai Ren, but since Ding was a commoner, she was unable to marry him. Shang Wen Jie and An promised to enfeif Ding Wai Ren as Marquis, thus making it possible for him to marry Princess Ai Yi, if Ai Yi gave her approval to the marriage of Xiao Di and Shang Wan An's daughter. Princess Ai Yi was persuaded, and, being supreme when it came to matters of the inner palace, she got the young couple hitched in spring 83, despite the objections of Huo Guang. Huo Guang did manage to throw a little spanner in the works, though. He refused to grant Ding Wai Ren at Marcus 8, upsetting Princess Ai Yi and the Shang Wans. The whole incident sparked a rift between Huo Guang and the others, which would never be repaired. The men in government couldn't just occupy themselves with internal political intrigue, though. There were challenges facing the country as a whole that demanded responses. Zhao Di's China was reeling from the extraordinary costs of Wu Di's military conquests. The hand needed to find a balance between reducing the financial burden the military activity entailed and protecting the territories that had been won. Xiao Di's reign can be seen as the first stage of a transition from a foreign policy of expansion to one of retrenchment. China's territorial acquisitions exposed it to new problems. In the southwest, several new commanderies had been established, which incorporated a number of tribal peoples. These commanderies had been grouped together as the Yi province, one of those 13 regional inspection areas that had been created in 106. In 86 BC, several tribes of the Yi province rose up in revolt, and even after the initially successful repression, violence broke out again in 83 and 82. In the revolt of 82 BC, 30,000 tribes people were taken captive, and 50,000 of their livestock. Another group of western barbarians, the Di, rebelled in 81. These people had been known to the Chinese for a long time. In our first episode on the Qin State, 
we saw how much of Chin's early history involved conflict with the Rongandi tribes. Under Han, the Di had inhabited the western portion of the Han Zhong commandery, which was south of the capital, but they were brought into greater friction with the Chinese government when their part of the Han Zhong commandery was split off and made into the Wudu commandery, as part of the general southward expansion which followed the victory over Nanyue in 111. The rebellion was suppressed with a force comprised of convict soldiers. In some places, new commanderies simply had to be abandoned. In 81, the Zhen Pan commandery, possibly along with the Lin Tun commandery, which were the most remote of the commanderies that had been created on the Korean peninsula, were abolished. The same year, the Dan'e commandery, one of two on Hainan Island in the South China Sea, was disestablished. In both these cases, the territories of the abolished commanderies were technically incorporated into neighbouring commanderies, but the move implies a lessening of administrative penetration of those areas. The disestablishment of these commanderies in Korea and Hainan Island suggests that the government felt that the extension of the empire into those remote areas was not worth the cost of maintenance. China wasn't entirely in withdrawal for Xiao Di's reign, though. Two notable instances of aggression occurred. First in 78 against the Wu Huan, a nomadic people who had been settled in the northeast, and then in 77 against Luo Lan, one of the cities in the western regions. The Wu Huan had been allies of the Xiongnu, but after the Han succeeded in driving the Shanyu north of the Gobi in 119, they decided to try and separate the two groups. They settled the Wu Huan in five northeastern commanderies, and put them under the charge of a new office called Colonel Protector of the Wu Huan. The Wu Huan were allowed a fairly high degree of independence, as well as protection from the Xiongnu, in exchange for paying annual tribute to the Han as a symbol of submission and helping to gather intelligence on the Xiongnu. However, the transition of the Wu Huan from Xiongnu vassals to Han ones didn't go as smoothly as the Chinese hoped. The Xiongnu still managed to occasionally extract tribute from the Wu Huan and punish them for their joining the Han and it's unlikely that the nomadic Wu Huan stayed within the territory of the commanderies they had been assigned to. In 78 BC, the Wu Huan insulted the Xiongnu by digging up the graves of some Shan Yus. The Xiongnu attacked them, and the Han sent an army under Fan Mingyu in response. However, by the time Fan's army arrived, the Xiongnu had already withdrawn. Fan had orders not to make the expedition in vain, so instead he attacked the Wu Huan, killing more than 6,200 of them including three chieftains. Fan was not at all punished for this attack on a people who were ostensibly Han allies. Historians have tried to explain this apparently outrageous event. Homer H. Dobbs considers the incident to have been an unnecessary and unprovoked attack on a basically friendly people, a result of Fan Mingyu's own initiative, and a sign that Huo Guang's attitude to the peoples on China's borders was rather callous. However, according to historian Yu Ying Shi, the Wu Huan had been raiding Chinese settlements, and Fan's attack was in retaliation for these offences. Either way, it brought the relationship with the Wu Huan to a new low. From then on, Wu Huan attacks became a not infrequent occurrence. The case of Luo Lan was an example of more subtle aggression. The state of Luo Lan was based on the Salt Lake Lop Nor, which is now mostly dried up, but at that time was a thriving oasis in the western desert. In 108, as part of the struggle between the Han and the Xiongnu, the king of Luo Lan had sent two sons as hostages, one to the court of the emperor and one to that of the Shan Yu. Taking princes as hostages was a long-established diplomatic strategy in China, which the Xiongnu picked up in the competition over the western regions. In 92, when a new king came to the throne of Luo Lan, he again sent sons to the two courts. When this king died, the Xiongnu rushed their hostage prince back to Luo Lan so that he could take the throne. They were successful, and Luo Lan became pro-Xiongnu and started attacking Han envoys to the west. Rather than responding with an army, Huo Guang sent an envoy named Fu Jiezi with a small company of men to Luo Lan. They camped outside the capital and attempted, and tempted the king to come out of his city and join them with promises of rich presents. When he came to the camp, they got him drunk and then stabbed him to death. The Chinese sent their own hostage prince to assume the throne, along with a Chinese wife and a guard of 40 Chinese soldiers. Luo Lan was renamed Shan Shan and effectively became a Chinese puppet state. It was a very effective and efficient way to deal with the problem. On the foreign front, there was one great relief for China, the diminishment of the Xiongnu. 
aside from their involvement in the Wuhan affair. There is just one recorded instance of a Xiongnu attack on China in the winter of 87, before Xiaodi's reign had officially begun. The Xiongnu were having a problem with expiring Shan Yus. Between 114 and 60 BC, there were seven different Shan Yus, of whom only two reigned for more than ten years. One of those two, named Hu Yanti, was Shan Yu for most of Xiaodi's reign. He ruled the confederacy from 85 to 69. However, he was so young when he inherited the position that his mother carried him around in a sling. The Xiongnu's political system was severely strained by the change in circumstances that Wudi's campaigns had created. We talked in episode 8 about the weakness of the decentralised government structure, with events like the Hunye King's surrender in 121 depriving the Xiongnu of tens of thousands of warriors. The parallel reigns of Hu Yanti and Xiao Di, both child rulers, suggests another weakness. The Xiongnu probably did not have structures like the Chinese had to keep their empire focused when an infant was on the throne. While the confederacy held together under Hu Yanti, it was not able to mount any serious attacks on China, and it would undergo a major crisis during the reign of China's next emperor. Difficulties with foreign peoples were only one side of the legacy of Wudi's expansion. The costs of these conquests had crippled China. Ban Yu said, quote, the country within the four seas was depopulated and exhausted, the population was reduced by half. Although this must surely be an exaggeration, Huoguang had to reform policy to allow the people to recover. Efforts were made both to lighten the obligations placed on the people by the government, and to provide help to the needy. On the former front, a variety of measures were implemented. Tax cancellations were used several times, such as in 85, when the land tax was remitted for the year, 83, when the requirement for households to donate horses to the government was completely scrapped, in 79, the tax on horses was cancelled for the year, and in 77, the poll tax on children was cancelled for two years. Also in that year, people who had failed to pay the military tax, which was a levy of three cash on all men from the ages of 15 to 56, were forgiven. Another method of making the tax burden easier was to allow taxes that would usually be paid in cash to be paid in kind. I've mentioned before that the demand for that most taxes be paid in cash was an extra burden for farmers. Not only did they have to produce their crop, they had to produce enough to sell, or else they had to find extra work where they would be paid in cash. Such allowances were made for the collection of the military tax in the metropolitan region in 79 and 75. The edict accompanying the announcement in 75 makes it explicit that this was done because of low grain prices that year, making it very hard for peasants to make enough money selling their crop. It read, quote, Verily, when grain is cheap, it injures agriculture. Now the grain in the districts of the three adjuncts and the Grand Master of Ceremonies, that is, the three metropolitan commanderies and the funerary towns therein, is getting lower and cheaper in price. Let it be ordered that beans and cereals may be used to take the place of this year's military taxes. As well as easing obligations, a helping hand was extended to the impoverished. One interesting method was for the government to provide loans to those who didn't have the resources to buy or grow food. This was done in the spring of 85, and then in the autumn of that year, their debts were cancelled in light of some natural disasters. This system of loans was apparently continued for most of the reign, though the only other recorded instance of debts being cancelled was in 78. This cancellation accompanied the abolishing of an imperial park called Zhongwu and the the redistribution of its land to the poor, as well as imperial granaries being opened up to the public following some bad floods. An edict from 74 BC, towards the end of Xiaodi's reign, reports that the empire was taking its first steps of recovery from its exhaustion. Quote, The empire considers agriculture and sericulture to be the fundamental activities. Recently we have lessened our expenses, have abolished those offices that are not urgently necessary, and have reduced the corvée labour at places away from people's homes. Those who plough and cultivate silkworms have become increasingly many, and yet our subjects have not yet been able to have sufficient food and clothing, even for their homes. We are very solicitous for them. The edict went on to announce that the poll tax on children would be reduced. The government also made special efforts to listen to the grievances of the people. In late winter 86-5, to 
Wang Ping, a former superintendent of justice, and four other men were sent out to, quote, inspect the commanderies and kingdoms, to recommend capable and good persons, to ask the common people about what they suffered from and were distressed by, and about those who had lost their occupations because of winter wrongs done to them. Such projects culminated in a famous debate in 81, known as the Salt and Iron Conference. The debate was between representatives of the government, including the imperial councillor, Sang Hong Yang, and a cabal of classical scholars, who were ostensibly representing the complaints of the common people. The nominal topic for discussion was whether the state monopolies on salt, iron and alcohol should be abolished. These had been created by Sang Hong Yang during the reign of Wu Di. However, the argument touched on nearly every important issue facing China, from specifics such as how it should engage with people beyond its frontiers, and what was the appropriate role of trade in the economy, to general philosophical principles about the nature and method of government. We have a written account of the debate, which was composed by a scholar named Huan Quan in the reign of the next emperor. The text is called Salt and Iron Discourses. Huan had been present at the conference as part of the literati side. We have to be cautious about the objectivity of his account. According to a 16th century AD scholar named Du Mu, who wrote the preface to an edition of the discourses, Huan, quote, developed and expanded the subject matter in the form of a dialogue in order to establish a school of thought. This suggests that Huan was more concerned with crafting the position of the classicists into a coherent philosophy than with accurately representing the debate. Even so, the discourses is a useful resource for understanding the issues that confronted China around this time, and for understanding the talking points of the different positions. And even if Huan designed it to make the points advanced by the literati appear stronger, I think to modernise many of the arguments of Sang Hongyang would seem more correct. The positions advanced by the representatives of the government in the discourses have been labelled modernist, while those of the classical scholars, reformist. The modernists defended the state's control of the salt and iron industries as a way of raising funds necessary to maintain China's military and to provide relief to people in times of need. They also saw the monopolies as a way of preventing evil individuals from gaining wealth and power, like Liu Pi, the king of Wu, had done in Jingde's reign. According to them, the nature of these resources meant that if they were made available for private exploitation, only malicious people would succeed in profiting from them. Quote, Now the sources of power and profit are assuredly in the mountain fastnesses and the depths of the marshes. Only aggressive people can come at their wealth. Now to give the people free reign to strive after power and profit and to end the salt and iron monopoly would be to give advantage to the overbearing and aggressive in pursuit of their covetous practices. The reformists argued that it was inappropriate for government officials to be engaged in such industries. Their proper role was to inspire the common man towards agricultural pursuits. They made more specific criticisms as well. For instance, they alleged that the monopoly approach to producing iron tools resulted in an inadequate one-size-fits-all approach. Quote, Now in Qin, Shu, Yan and Qi, the quality of the soil differs. There is a variety in the methods of cultivation of heavy and light soils. The use of large or small, the suitability of straight or curved ploughs, are different according to districts and customs. Each has its convenient use. But when magistrates establish monopolies and standardise, then iron implements lose their suitability, and the farming population loses their convenient use. Reformists criticised other economic policies, including the state's monopoly on minting and the balanced standard system, which involved the government buying, stockpiling and selling goods in such a way as to keep prices stable. The reformists advocated for a less monetary economy, with more taxes being paid in kind rather than cash, and thought it unbecoming for government officials to behave like merchants. They said that people did not trust the new coins which had been issued in Wudi's reign. The modernists again defended the practices, saying that the monopoly on minting was necessary to ensure standard coinage, and that the equal supply system helped to maintain trust in the market and to deter unsavoury characters from becoming wealthy and powerful. Quote, With the establishment of equilibrium in prices, the people are not suspicious. Even a lad only five feet tall may be sent to the market and no one could cheat him. If now the monopolies be removed, then aggressive persons would control the use and engross the profits. They would dominate the market. 
Prices would be raised or lowered at a word. There would be no stability in prices, dear or cheap. Among other things, the reformists also called for the disestablishment of unnecessary government offices, the discontinuation of trade with faraway peoples, and they worried over economic inequality. Generally speaking, the two sides presented different economic theories. They both distinguished between so-called fundamental and accessory occupations, the fundamental occupations being farming and sericulture, which produced the vital goods of food and clothing, and the accessory occupations being trade and craftsmanship. But they differed in their prescriptions regarding how these two types of economic activity generated wealth. The modernists argued that the accessory activities, trade and craftsmanship, were essential for full prosperity. They argued that poverty was a result of an inadequate distribution of goods. Quote, Artisans, merchants, and carpenters and mechanics are all for the use of the state and to provide tools and implements. They have existed from ancient times and are not a unique feature of the present age. Farmers and merchants exchange their goods so that both the fundamental and the accessory pursuits may be benefited. People who live in the mountains and marshes or on the moors and sterile uplands depend on the effective circulation of goods to satisfy their wants. Thus, it would not be only those who have abundance that have a surplus, and only those who have little that would starve. If everybody stays where he lives and consumes his own food, then oranges and pumelos would not be sold, chulu salt would not appear, rugs and carpets would not be marketed, and the timber of Wu and Tang would not be used. But the reformists insisted that the fundamental occupations, agriculture and sericulture, were all that were necessary, and that deficiencies in wealth were the result of not enough people being engaged in these occupations. Trade and artisanship were luxury activities that distracted from what was vital. There seems to have been a fundamental miscommunication between the two groups. For the modernists, fine living, ornamental niceties, and other such things were signs of a wealthy society. But for the reformists, they indicated decadence, that people were concentrating on the non-essential at the expense of the fundamental. Quote, People wear fine clothes and eat delicate food. Even in humble cottages and straw-thatched huts, we hear ballads singing and playing on stringed instruments, wanton for a day, in want for a month, caroling in the morning, morning in the evening. Zhao and Zhang Shan border the Great River. They form the connecting centre of the radiating roads and are situated on the highway of the world. Merchants throng the ways. Princes meet on the streets. But the people's trend is to the non-essential pursuits. They grow luxurious, disregarding the fundamentals. The fields are not cultivated, while the men and women vie with one another in dress. Without a peck of reserve in the house, the loot thrums in the hole. This is why, of the people of Chu and Zhao, most are poor and a few are rich. On the other hand, the people in Song, Wei, Han and Liang adhere to the fundamental and till the soil. Among the common people in Yeomanry, every house prospers and every person is satisfied. The reformists believed that if officials set the right example, then the people would concentrate on the fundamental occupations, and there would be a surplus of food and clothes. Furthermore, with the right moral education, people would be satisfied with having their basic needs met. It's this sort of thinking that makes it really difficult for me, at least, to understand where the reformists were coming from. I haven't seen such a thing, but I'd be really interested to see an economist's assessment of the discourses and especially of whether the reformists had any really valid points. That's not to say that the modernist economic theory was completely in agreement with what we understand today. After all, I can't imagine many of today's economists arguing in favour of the large-scale market intervention stuff that the modernists advocated for. But to me, at least, it looks like the modernists had realised the importance of trade and crafts, while the reformists were clinging to an old-fashioned, agrarian-centric conception of the economy. That's not to say that the reformists didn't bring up any valid points, though. Their attitude to foreign policy was something we might find more agreeable. While the modernists believed aggressive military campaigns necessary for the security of China, the modernists decried the costs and suffering caused by expansionist wars, and differentiated between what was good for the state and what was good for the people. When the modernists celebrated how the reforms of Shangyang had turned Qin into a wealthy and powerful country, the reformists reminded them that such programs in conquest did not necessarily benefit the common welfare. Quote, when Shangyang introduced his harsh laws and increased his profit, the people of Qin could not endure life and among themselves wept for Duke Xiao. When Wu Qi increased the army and engaged in a series of conquests, 
the people of Chu were grievously disturbed, and among themselves they shed tears for King Tao. So resentment increased with the growth of profit, and sorrows multiplied with the extension of territory. However, the reformist alternative to attacking hostile nations is again sure to raise some eyebrows today. Rather than outlining a program for a more defensive military strategy, they resorted to cliches about how a virtuous ruler could inspire barbarians to willingly acknowledge themselves as servants. Quote, The Son of Heaven should not speak about much and little, the feudal lord should not talk about advantage and detriment, ministers about gain and loss, but they should cultivate benevolence and righteousness, to set an example to the people, and extend wide their virtuous conduct to gain the people's confidence. Then will nearby folk lovingly flock to them, and distant peoples joyfully submit to their authority. The point about cultivating benevolence and righteousness and leading by virtue is a theme we've talked about several times already. But basically, the reformists look to an idealised past, the kings of Jor, whom Confucius venerated, as their model, while the modernists governed by the theories of reward and punishment that the legalist school had developed. There were the same jabs at each other, the modernists accused the reformists of being impractical, while the reformists accused the modernists of lacking principles. Modernists argued that times changed and governments had to adapt, while the reformists insisted that despite service-level changes, there are eternal moral principles of government and that the examples of the sage kings of the past were still relevant. Sang Hong Yang, apparently getting frustrated with his opponents, is credited with this epic tirade. We have now convened with us over 60 of your class, O worthies and literati. You who cherish the practices of the six arts, fleet in thought and exhaustive in argument. You ought now to let out the flood of your light and dispel our ignorance. Come, show to us how you disparage everything modern, putting all your trust in the past. How you discourse upon antiquity with never a reference to present conditions. Is it due to our idiosyncrasies that we are unable to recognise a scholar? Or is it rather your habit of falsifying truth by slandering ability in your stilted tirades? How difficult it is to find a really worthy scholar. From Ni Quan of Qian Sheng, upon whom was bestowed the hat of a high minister for his studies on the book of history, down to all the recommended scholars that I have ever seen or heard, or as soaring high as recipients of imperial favour, None has shown transcendent and ability. None has helped the government in solving difficulties. None has had any merit, whatever. For their part, the reformists lambasted the low-minded modernists of Wudi's reign and their pernicious policies. Quote, now come to the four ministers specialising in levying taxes and promoting profits. On the Jing, on the Huai, rivers. Sluices were now built to facilitate transportation. Dong Guo Yan and Kong Jin proposed their plan for the Sultan I monopoly and other sources of profit. The rich were allowed to purchase rank in office and to escape punishment through the payment of fines. Public expenses continued to grow while the administrators chased after their own private profit, the people being forced to satisfy both. The masses being hardly able to bear this, they opposed malpractices and observed the law. Thus, ruthless officials were given promotion there appeared the novel laws of implicating witnesses and lesser majesty, insulting the monarch. Men like Du Jour and Chan Swan, one renowned for their pitiless, vulture-like judicial murders. Few were those who, holding fast to the principles of benevolence and justice, wanted to serve their prince, while a multitude conformed themselves to secure toleration from above. The main objective of the scholars, who attended the Sultanite Conference, the disbandment of those monopolies, was not achieved. However, they did score a minor victory in the abolishment of the monopoly on alcohol, which happened a month after the conference. And as we've seen this episode, with the slowing down of frontier expansion, and will continue to see in upcoming episodes, in the grand scheme of things, China was heading in the reformist Confucian direction. For now though, we need to keep our attention on more immediate matters. Sang Hong Yang wasn't very happy after the debates, even though the Sultan I monopolies were maintained, he interpreted the hosting of the debates as a sign that some men in government were critical of these programs that he was so proud of. He began to bear a grudge against Huo Guang for inviting all these scholars to come and lecture him with their worthless opinions. Thus, he began to draw towards the others who were upset with the status quo. Shang Guanjie and An, who were ambitious for power. Princess Ai Yi, upset that her lover, Ding Wai Ren, had not been given a marquisate. And the king of Yan, Liu Dan who thought that he should be emperor. 
a few years after the falling out between Shang Wanjia and Huo Guang, but before the Salt and Iron Conference, there had been a strange incident. In the spring of 82 BC, a man came to Chang'an and started ranting at the gates of the palace. He claimed to be Liu Zhu, the son of Wu Di by Empress Wei, who had been killed during the witch trials in the final years of Wu Di's reign. The man was apprehended and executed. Perhaps it was just a freak incident, but it might be an indication that doubt over the legitimacy of Xiao Di and Huo Guang's government remained strong. Remember, as part of his first coup attempt, Liu Dan had been spreading rumours that Xiao Di was not really Wu Di's son. In summer 81, Shang Guan An was in fief as Marquis of Sang Luo. This was appropriate, seeing as he was the father of the Empress, but it was perhaps also an attempt by Huo Guang to keep the Shang Guans on side. Nevertheless, their relationship continued to deteriorate. In 80, after Sang Hongyang had joined the discontented, Shang Wan Jia and An, Princess A Yi, and Sang started to plot Huo Guang's downfall. They communicated with Liu Dan, asking him to slander Huo to the Emperor in an attempt to get Huo deposed. Perhaps they thought that Liu Dan, being Zhao Di's half-brother, would be able to persuade the 15-year-old. However, Zhao Di was loyal to Huo. He expressed his trust in Huo shortly after these events, declaring, quote, The General-in-Chief, Huo Guang, is the most faithful minister of the government, and was the one to whom the late Emperor Wu entrusted the empire. Whoever dares to slander or speak evil of him shall be sentenced to punishment. With the attempt at slander failed, the conspirators decided to resort to drastic measures. They planned to invite Huo to a dinner with Princess A Yi, where he would be assassinated. Then, they would depose Xiao Di and make Liu Dan emperor. In fact, Shang Wan An secretly hoped to assassinate Liu Dan as well, and then make his own father, Shang Wan Jie, the emperor, thus usurping the imperial clan entirely. But a member of Princess Yi's Yi's entourage discovered the plot and informed Huo Guang. Huo acted quickly. Shang Wan Jie, Shang Wan An, and Sang Hong Yang were all executed. Liu Dan and Princess A Yi were allowed the dignity of committing suicide. All others who were involved with the plot were demoted to commoner status, including Liu Dan's sons and Princess A Yi's son. Those who had helped uncover the conspiracy were promoted to be Marquises. The conspiracy and punishments were announced in an imperial edict, which described the incident as, quote, treason and an inhuman crime. With the removal of Shang Wan Jie and Sang Hong Yang, Huo Guang was the most powerful man in government. Though Shang Wan Jie and An had married An's daughter to Xiao Di in service of their own ambitions, the marriage now ended up benefiting Huo Guang. Since the girl was the product of An's marriage to Huo Guang's own daughter, Huo was her grandfather, and now the only significant male relative of the Empress. He was careful to keep rivals happy or out of the picture. In 76, the kingdom of Liu Su, the other remaining son of Wu Di, was increased. For as long as Xiao Di remained on the throne, it looked like Huo Guang's position was secure. Xiao Di turned 18 in 77 BC, and underwent a coming-of-age ceremony. Even after becoming an adult, though, he was happy to continue cooperating with Huo Guang. It was unfortunate for Huo Guang, then, that Xiao Di died unusually young. On the day Guai Wei, in the fourth month of the first year of the year of Yuan Ping, the 5th of March, 74 BC, he passed away in the Weiyang Palace. His untimely death has raised eyebrows over whether there was any foul play involved, but there is no textual evidence to suggest anything of the sort. Huo Guang had come out on top in the bumpy transition from Wu Di to Zhao Di. Now the question of secession was even more rocky, because Zhao Di had not fathered any sons. Liu Su was the only other living son of Wu Di, though there were already reservations over his ability to rule. He was considered something of a ruffian. Perhaps, then, there were some more malleable grandsons or great-grandsons of Wu Di out there, who could be summoned to Chang'an to assume the dragon throne. Could Huo manipulate the secession in his favour? And what would happen if the next emperor turned out not to be so obedient? These are all questions we'll answer next time, in episode 11 of All Under Heaven. <laughs> Thank you.
As a final little point, one thing that's worth explaining a bit is the title Huoguang received at the secession of Xiao Di, Marshal of State, Da Sima in Chinese. This was an honorary title, which did not carry with it any official duties. However, it outranked all the ministers of the government, even the Chancellor, and thus Wu Di had conferred it on Huoguang, or Huo gave it to himself, so that he would be in a position to lead the government of Xiao Di. For the remainder of Western Han, it was usually used by the director of the Secretariat. It also became standard practice for men who were acting as regents to use it. The position is sometimes conflated with that of the Supreme Commander, one of the Three Excellencies and the highest military official, because that post was left permanently vacant after the reign of Wu Di. However, as far as I can tell, the titles weren't really related at all until Eastern Han, when the title Marshal of State was used for the Eastern Han equivalent of the Supreme Commander. Dubs renders Da Sima as Commander-in-Chief, but in my quoting his translation from the Book of Han, I'll substitute Marshal of State for Commander-in-Chief. So not much more to say this time. Uh, If you've been enjoying these, I'd love to hear some feedback. You can leave a review on iTunes or you can contact me at uh, offspin-history at tutornota.com or you can use the message box on my website, offspinhistory.wordpress.com As always, I'd like to thank Shui Shan Yu of Northeastern University for letting me use his music from the album Guchin Music, The Vibrant Rhythm of Ancient Heroes.